Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm Ben Iberly. Uh going to be presenting um, work based on the thesis research, the thesis research that I've been doing uh, at Humboldt State University. Um, I'll be defending that thesis this fall. Um, and that work has been in collaboration with, of course, my advisor, Steve Sillett, um, also Bob Van Pelt, who's here, a researcher at HSU, and Mark Andre, uh, the Environmental Services Director for the City of Arcata. Um, what we've been working on is this uh, rare long-term data set um, that is from two research plots that are just a few miles from here in Arcata. Uh, to start us out, I've got um, a couple pictures from the plots. Uh, what's on the left here is t uh, a picture from 1923 when the plots were established. And on the right is a picture that I took trying to recreate that photo. Um, so you can see there's tree, so how, how well can we see this? Tree numbers on the left that they painted on the trees. Um, and I've put on the right photo some of the tree numbers replicated. So you can see tree 123 is gone. Uh, you can see tree 131 in the middle there uh, with quite a bit of growth. Uh, same with tree 122. 132, a grand fir on the right side. It's got that um, extra trunk coming off the side. You can kind of see in the background of the old photo, um, which really helped locate this, locate this particular spot. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a cool reconstruction to show to get us started. Uh, to set the stage, um, zooming way out, um, as we all know, the vast majority of redwood forests were logged sometime in the last 160 years. The red on the map is the remaining old growth forest, right? Um, and so the rest, all that green, um, can be redwood forests that are somewhere from zero to 160 years in stand age. However, most of the data that we have on second growth redwood forests uh, only only covers from zero to 50 or 60 years. That's most of the literature that exists. Um, and there's only a few examples that we have that cover um, a, broader, um, a broader time period. Um, that 50 to 60 year span is only a third of that possible max, maximum stand age of 160. And it's even a smaller slice of the stand developmental sequence that you might see before you get to an old growth state in a redwood forest. Um, that one of the good examples that we do have of what you could call mature second growth forest um, is Fritz's Wonder Plot, well known, uh, presented at this symposium in 1996. Um, and that is a one acre plot in Mendocino County um, that was studied from 70 years of stand age to 150 years. Um, it's an allu alluvial floodplain stand uh, that demonstrated second growth redwoods tremendous capacity for growth over time. The Metcalf plots that we're looking at today um, are another unique opportunity to look at a broader section of the de developmental sequence of second growth redwood forests. Um, there are two plots um, that we're, we're calling the Metcalf plots. Um, they're each one acre in size, uh, and they were established in 1923 by Woodbridge Metcalf, who worked with Emmanuel Fritz, um, and he's a professor from UC Berkeley. These are just two plots, so that means that we can't really form broad conclusions about um, second growth redwood forests throughout the entire range, but this can be an interesting case study. Um, we can compare it to the wonder plot. Um, and uh, we can hopefully compare it to future research. So here's a timeline for the plots to orient us temporally. Um, the stand was logged, where these plots are, was logged sometime between 1875 and 1885, uh, based on the data that we have and the records that we have. Um, the plots were established in 1923, and then resurveyed about every 10 years until 1963 um, by Metcalf and people that worked with him. Um, nothing happened then until 1990, when uh, Rudolf Becking, a professor at HSU, uh, came back and resurveyed the plots, um, and actually Mark Andre helped on, those sur on that survey. Um, then once again, there was a stretch of time where nothing happened uh, with the plots and the data. And then in 2013, Bob Van Pelt um, found out about these plots through the records that the city of Arcata had and thought, hey, this is a really cool opportunity. We should do something with this. To get us oriented spatially, zoomed way out. Um, so we're in, our, in where Eureka is on that map. Um, uh, where the Metcalf plots are. The Wonder Plot um, is very close to where Mendocino is on that map. Zooming way in, um, 
so the Metcalf plots are in the Arcata Community Forest. Uh, they're right in the thick of everything. Um, we've got the lower plot and the upper plot on the map here. Um, that's all I'll be referring to these two plots throughout the presentation. Hopefully I don't switch to plot one and two because that's another designation that we've got. Um, there's trails going through both the plots. They're both right next to roads or parking lots. Um, so there is a lot of human impact, which is an interesting thing to keep in mind as we go through um, the context of these plots. So moving on to the surveys that were completed, um, the 23 to 63 surveys um, were pretty straightforward. Um, they collected DBH species and crown class for all the trees over three inches in diameter. Um, they collected height measurements for some of the trees, but not all of them in a fairly haphazard way. Um, and you can see on the bottom of the slide there, uh, one of the original data sheets from 1923 that uh, we were able to transcribe from. And that's a picture from 1923 as well of, the, of uh, people working in the plot. The survey in 1990 was uh, fairly similar. Um, DB, DBH species crown class, um, again, height for only some of the trees. Uh, luckily for us, they did draw maps of the tree locations, as you can see on the slide there, um, uh, unlike the previous surveys, uh, which allowed us to link up a lot of the trees in the plot more easily. The current surveys that we did um, in 2013 and 2015 um, for each respective plot, um, we use modern methods similar to what Steve and Bob have been using in the um, Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative plots in the old growth. Um, so that includes uh, measuring functional diameter at breast height, which takes into account the um, irregular shape of the trunk, um, diameter at top of buttress, uh, where the trunk becomes round. Um, also, total height and height to crown base and four crown radii, which is, allows us to calculate crown volume. Uh, we also created accurate stem maps um, using laser and compass. And what you see there is a very nice map of the lower plot that uh, Bob Van Pelt created. We also intensively measured four trees in the plots, um, two redwoods and two spruces that were some of the tallest trees in the plots. Um, that means that we mapped the crowns, measuring uh, all the trunks, the branches. Um, we also collected increment cores um, from all four of these trees. Uh, and then using the dendrochronological, uh, dendrochronological techniques that Ali was just talking about, we were able to reconstruct the height growth of these trees uh, over the time period that we have data in these plots, which means that we were able to compare the historical height measurements from those surveys to the reconstruction that we did with the increment cores. So for each of these four trees, we have the reconstructed height growth, the black line um, that we did with the cores, and then the red dots are the survey measurements. Um, so we were gratified to see that the height measurements are actually pretty accurate, um, despite height being commonly a pretty difficult measurement to, to complete accurately in these forests. We also took those four trees and threw them into some larger data sets uh, that the Sillet Lab has to build new allometric equations for second growth redwood and for Sitka spruce and Douglas fir. Um, we were predicting uh, these tree level quantities that you see like above ground biomass and leaf mass and leaf area um, using things that you can measure from the ground like DBH and diameter at top of buttress and height and crown volume. Um, we also created versions of these equations that only used DBH to predict those quantities uh, because many of the records from the previous surveys or for trees where they only had DBH measurements and not height measurements or crown volume. So moving on to the actual results now that I've uh, steamed through the methods. Um, here we've just got some basic stats uh, on the plots. On the left side, you've got the lower plot. On the right side, you've got the upper plot. And then we've got number of trees. Uh, it's on a per acre basis as each plot is one acre. And then basal, total basal area split up by species. Um, right, so you can see just some general notes. Uh, redwood in both of the plots is experiencing probably some density dependent, density dependent mortality in the first half um, of the time period we're looking at. And then in the second half, uh, it levels off, um, probably showing uh, mortality balancing out with uh, regeneration that's starting to occur in the plots. Um, on the other hand, the non-redwood species are all on a pretty slow, steady decline in terms of tree number. Um, they're starting to drop out of the plots. Uh, in terms of basal area, uh, the plot totals double, about double, over the 90-year period that we're looking at. Um, and redwood is becoming increasingly dominant in terms of the proportion of the basal, total basal area that it takes up in the plot. 
Um, the other thing you can see from these is that there's a bit of a plateau or dip. Um, oh, that's not what that does. Uh-oh. Sorry. Um, a bit of a plateau or dip uh, in between 43 and 60, 1943 and 1963 um, in basal area, and that's because of uh, some significant wind throw events that occurred in that period in both of the plots. Um, so that's why you're seeing uh, less growth in those periods. So I've also got to look at some um, diameter distributions for each of the species in every single year that was surveyed, uh, so that each column is a particular species and each row uh, is a particular year. Uh, if we look at the redwoods, we can see that the range is in really increasing over time. Uh, and by the end of the time period, we have a range all the way from zero, uh, zero or five centimeters to 150 centimeters. Um, the shape is also flattening out. It's much less peaked. And we're starting to see the distribution become right skewed at the end. Uh, kind of like a reverse J type distribution. Um, and that's with the recruitment of small trees in the understory beginning in the redwood species. Uh, for non-redwoods, um, the ranges are all really shifting upwards, sliding up the scale um, with not very much recruitment happening uh, for those trees under the dense canopy um, since those are shade intolerant species. Uh, you can see the grand fir is almost completely died out in the lower plot. There's only a, uh, a couple of them left. In the upper plot, um, you see a pretty similar trend in redwood, although it's not as right skewed by the end of the time period um, as in the lower plot. Um, there are a lot more grand fir in the upper plot, um, but they're also starting to die out. Uh, and if you're in the plot, you can really see that a lot of them are on their last legs uh, and seem like they won't last too much longer. So uh, one of our objectives was to compare these plots to the wonder plot. Um, here we've got the wonder plot added to these charts um, in the black line there. Uh, totals for the wonder plot are just for redwood because that stand is pure redwood. Um, and yeah, so you can see that uh, the redwood, uh, the wonder plot has really um, outperformed the Metcalf plots uh, in terms of total basal area over uh, equivalent stand age. On the x-axis, we've got equivalent stand age rather than calendar year. Um, so we're matching up the stand ages for these two plots. Um, one thing I'm pointing out on this graph, though, we've got this dashed line uh, for the wonder plot for basal area that is uh, second growth trees only. There uh, were initially seven remnant old growth trees in those plots. Um, and by the end of the time period, there's only three. But they really represent a pretty large chunk of the basal area, considering that it's only three to seven trees over time. Um, yeah, and then the last thing to notice, obviously, is that there's a huge dive uh, in the wonder plot totals. Um, that's because of a big wind throw that occurred before the 2005 survey. Um, and so that actually means that uh, the Metcalf plots, assuming growth continues uh, and the same trend, uh, will be about even with the wonder plot in the future. Um, so the wonder plot was winning until mortality evened the score. We can also compare the Metcalf plots to old growth plots, um, which uh, Ali was showing you a map of earlier. Um, here we're looking at four of the old growth plots from the Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative, um, two in Redwood National Park and two in Prairie Creek State Park. Um, so what we can see is that uh, the leaf mass for the Metcalf plots is actually fairly close to what uh, the total leaf mass is in the old growth plots. And this is on a, a per hectare basis instead of a per acre basis, but per area. Um, however, on the other hand, of course, uh, the Metcalf plots don't compare even close uh, in terms of total mass per area. Um, and I think you could sum this up in, in terms of thinking about the photosynthetic capacity of these plots um, is roughly similar. Um, but that total mass accumulation is what happens when you have a stand of trees uh, with that kind of photosynthetic capacity being applied for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the Metcalf plots haven't had that time yet. Um, the other thing to note from here is that the leaf mass in the Metcalf plot still has that pretty significant proportion of non-redwood component. So just some final observations to wrap up. Um, in the Metcalf plots, uh, redwoods are starting to become dominant, but um, they still have a little ways to go in terms of being similar to old growth forests. Um, we've seen fairly strong growth in terms of 
uh, seems fairly strong growth in the plots, even though there's been heavy human impact in the plots, um, especially the upper plot. There's a lot of bare earth. Um, there's been a lot of uh, human traffic through there for quite a while. Um, and so it's interesting to think about how uh, these plots have seemed to seemingly flourished um, despite that um, impact. Uh, I think it's also interesting to think about um, comparing these plots to the wonder plots um, and keeping in mind the significant um, non-Redwood component that's still in these plots. Um, you know, we know certain things about uh, accelerating development, accelerating development with thinning, um, and so uh, you could see some potential there for accelerating development in stands like these plots, potentially. Um, yeah, and then in the future, hopefully these plots will continue to yield interesting results. Um, I think as we continue to observe it, uh, it'll become uh, more and more interesting, and I'd really like to be able to include Deadwood um, in these surveys, and we can get a better picture better co a complete picture of the carbon sequestration and things like that. Yeah. So a bunch of people to thank and a cool graph from 1933 and yeah. 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 So could you expand a bit on that? Last slide, uh, potential for accelerating growth. Just kind of what, what you're thinking on that. Yeah, well, I just think that um, these plots, it seems like there would be an opportunity um, if you're looking at stands like these plots to uh, use thinning or other techniques to accelerate their development toward old growth. And I think that people are looking into that, and I think that these stands just represent an interesting example of what happens if there's very little interference. Um, in second growth stands from when they were logged. Um, and so that can be used as sort of a benchmark uh, or an example to compare to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just at the, right after logging, there was almost certainly fire. Um, not, yeah, no. Where the mm -hmm. spots, um, periodically the forest plots were periodically right? Were they not? These ones? Yeah. Um, part of the complicated story that I couldn't get to is that they did do some thinning when they initiated this, the study in 1923, but in half of each plot. And so it's really hard to tell any patterns from it at all because it's such a small area. Um, it's, it's too random. Not, not so. But not since then. Right. There was one little corner where some trees were accidentally cut. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Ben. Yeah, thank you.